Um, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be moderating the next session. My name is Rob Arthur, Director of Partnerships at the Sustainable Energy Council who organised the event. And I'm delighted to be moderating a, a very interesting panel titled Careers Combating Climate Change. And we're looking at the challenges and opportunities within the hydrogen sector. And this is being led by Boss Energy Consulting, who are a great partner to us. They've sponsored the World Hydrogen Awards for the last three years. And uh, that happened yesterday. And I'm delighted uh, to be working with them and seeing the evolution of the industry in the three years we've been working, this probably wouldn't have been something that would have been a discussion point, And now it's very, very topical. In terms of the panel, um, I'm delighted to introduce from Boss Energy, Managing Director Mike Johnson, who's the founder of Boss Energy. Uh, also uh, delighted to have Dr. Fatima Reza Zadeh, who is the Group Vice President of Hydrogen and Renewables at Varo Energy. And very shortly, Gotcha, Dr. Gotcha Metz, who was on stage moments ago, is going to come back and join us as well. So we'll perhaps um, we'll carry on uh, sure. while we can, and she'll be here shortly. What I'm going to do is, is ask Mike to just set the scene a little bit and tell us a bit from his side uh, about the landscape and, and the, um, the sector. So over to you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Um, I probably should do a bit of an introduction. I'm Mike. I set Boss Energy up 10 years ago with a few other people, and we've been involved in um, energy, renewable energy recruitment for over 10 years. Um, we moved into hydrogen five years ago. And, probably been responsible for around four to five hundred placements globally since the summit began has begun um i think what's been really interesting like looking at the careers element i think this was touched upon last last night at the awards is you know companies are essentially a conglomerate of people you know and people make the businesses tick over and run so it's about looking at you know how talents evolved through maybe the last three summits i think if you take summit one you know you were looking at hydrogen being applicable in every scenario, every situation, and you know, companies were trying to fight for that market position, and you were seeing a lot of you know, flow of sales and business development professionals into the industry. Um, that's where probably the majority of our placements happened across the first summit. Um, fast forward an extra year, and the pace of the intensity of the industry has evolved into you know, the buzzwords like gigafactories, who's gonna be the next OEM, the next Tesla of the hydrogen economy. Um, and with that, you started to see the real shift of professionals from very established industries, you know, aerospace, oil and gas, automotive, you know, moving into the sector to try and uh, apply their trade in a, in a new and, you know, budding uh, economy and sector. Um, fast forward 12 months, and we've had a fairly interesting 12 months in the hydrogen economy. I'd probably say we're finding, you know, where the gas or whether the sector is most needed and you know most effective in energy transition um there's been some winners and losers over the last 12 months and so probably you know most people will probably be aware of that i think what's really interesting is the next 12 months and where we see project fids get green light and you know maybe you're starting to transition to more of a you know even a short-term temporary labor market i mean particularly if you look at h2 green steel and neon you know we're starting to see you know, subcontractors being put on site for six to 12 months, which is something that we've not seen over the last four years. And if it's going that way, it's only, only gonna explode exponentially as, as things move on. So yeah, that's probably what we've seen over the last four years. That gives a little introduction. Yeah, no, thank you very much. That's, that's um, fascinating. And again, I think talking about the people, that's what ultimately is gonna make the industry. And in terms of moving sort of into a panel discussion and welcome back, gotcha. Um, yeah. In terms of sort of opening things up to the panel, what is it we think is going to help make a successful career in, in hydrogen across the value chain? Fatima, maybe if we, we go to you. Uh, of course. Uh, I think uh, when we are talking about the hydrogen uh, you know, topics, uh, it requires a blend of technical knowledge as well as uh, leadership and soft skills, if you will. And uh, for example, you really need to have a good understanding of the technologies that along this you know, value chain that the hydrogen presents um, is, is part of, like electrolyzers, for instance. And also, for instance, you need to also have an understanding on the, on the downstream side, the, the, uh, the industries that are going to use hydrogen 
for their applications. So this knowledge, the technical knowledge should be there. In addition to that one, we are facing uh, an industry that is evolving and you know there are so many regulatory changes and uh, there are uh, changes in terms of the technology advancement and also changing on the demand side you know there there might be a demand in a profile completely different from yesterday for instance so uh, flexibility and uh, being able to embrace challenges and also you know, changes in the priorities are very important for those that they really want to be part of this sector. So beside techno and technological understanding, you need to have those soft skills in terms of eager to learn, you know, be flexible and also go after the topic and understanding yourself and have that curiosity that can help you to really unlock some of the questions. So if you have these qualities, I think you will be successful in this sector. You make it sound very easy. <laughs> gotcha from your side in terms of the industry. Yeah, I think um, it is curious. I, I, curiosity was also one, one of my points as well. I think, you know, we discussed it in the previous panel as well. Um, I think, you know, a, a lot of the sector is new and that means many of us are coming from something else. We come from oil and gas, we come from um, electrons business, um, shipping. So there's a lot that is coming. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that is transferable. So that ingenuity and being able to transfer your skills, um, the hydrogen sector is definitely one. Um, and in your opening, I missed a little bit, but I understood yeah. that we were talking about the role of hydrogen in the sector. So you want to have people who are really ambitious also about contributing to the decarbonization. You need passion to do this. It's a game of patience uh, that was said in the previous panel as well. Um, and that patience requires you to be also passionate. Um, and then on curiosity, I, I fully agree. It's really, really important, but we also need to be curious about um, yeah, it's also different, like curious about what happens to the molecules. So you want to know your end users better. You, you need to know where we, how we produce, how it's transported, and then where it's used. So we need to know different in hydrogen sector, across, have a knowledge across a value chain, and you need to be curious about that. And yeah, I think that's, that helps you to, to yeah, have a successful career, I suppose. Some of the elements. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I think we need to, on the whole, embrace the energy transition mm. and see the opportunity with, with the jobs rather than look at it in a different light and say, well, I might lose my job from that sector. It's actually the exciting bit is yeah. that there's opportunities further ahead. Mike, in terms of sort of interviewing candidates, I suppose, how do you sort of see that? What are you looking for in people? What are, what are employers asking for in people? Yeah, so I think, I think the, the hard and soft skills kind of what you, you guys are alluding to is really key, right? So like, let's take an engineer, for example, and I'll talk more about like P2X and project development because that's where the pinch points kind of are at the moment. But, you know, an engineer that's, let's, let's, let's say does PFD, P and ID, you know, you can do that in, in, in quite a few industries. But when you're working in an industry that hasn't really innovative been innovative or evolved in 30 or 40 years like how do you change your skill set and and the mindset shift to work in you know a sector where you might be rather than one of 10 engineers one of one and you have to do four or five different jobs at the same time be passionate you know be willing to work more than the nine to five that a big company would kind of set you up for there's loads of other things as well like you know the packages are different you know if you're moving from let's say tier one major EPC, you've got your pension and your job for life. Whereas if you move to hydrogen startup to develop a new TRL of technology, you know, you don't have a pension, you don't have all these things. And a lot of the conversations we're having with people at the moment is really like the balance between um, companies wanting skill sets and being able to find the right soft skills and also finding industry individuals that are willing to take the risk on hydrogen because you know, two years ago, you'd pick up the phone and ring someone and they'd jump at a hydrogen opportunity, whereas now, cash burn rate, how viable is your technology against your competitors? These are all questions that you're getting on a day-to-day -day basis that you probably never had before. So I guess where we come in is we can advise on the best ones and how to set up interview strategies to combat that with, with customers. So, yeah. So. Fatima, from your side, in terms of building a team and, and looking for people, what, what are you seeing? I think, uh, of course, you know, the person needs to have a very good understanding, the technological understanding about, you know, the hydrogen industry, 
and also in general what's going on in the, um, in the energy and energy sector and have a good understanding of the energy systems as well. So you need to have that basis, the engineering knowledge basis there. In addition to that one, as I said you know, previously, you, you, you need to really be problem solver and also doer yourself because the hydrogen industry is, is in, the, in its establishment phase. So a lot of hard work needs to be done at the beginning. Sometimes there are so many things unclear, there are so many ambiguities, there are changes in priorities, changes in the regulation. So that element of flexibility uh, should be there for that candidate in order to really survive and thrive in this, uh, in this environment. And of course, you know, leadership skills, communication skills to be able to work you know, with the team members are very important. And l l let's face it, this, it really takes a village, as they say, you know, to build a hydrogen industry. So it's a matter of collaboration, especially at the, begin at the beginning of that. So that element of collaboration, leadership are very important, as equal as you know, the technology side you know, in terms of capability to really drive the topic forward and go forward with that. Thank you. And Gotcha, from your perspective, I know you've been at Vattenfall relatively recently. What's your experience of moving and, and sort of being part of that experience? Yeah, um, I think it's been eight months now with Vattenfall and it feels much longer. <laughs> but I have to say, it depends a little bit. Like when we are, I'm, I'm sitting in interviews for both younger people and for senior people. I've done that already for Vattenfall and I have my interview I can tell you about. But what really matters to me, if we're interviewing a younger person, is really personality. We need like lots of fancy slides. They didn't do it in the first interview. I don't care, they'll learn that. But they need to have the right personality and openness to learn. And of course, yeah, technical background, etc. But yeah, there are lots of engineers. How are you going to select them? It needs to be a personal fit. Um, and that's the first thing. And when we're looking at a senior person, I think, like it's my case too, a role that has been advertised is never your role. You're gonna end up doing something else, in most cases. So you want the person to be flexible, innovative, out of the box thinking. This will be really important. And then we have more senior roles, and there, what I see is it really ma matters that you have a person who can manage upward and downward. Because you have to manage a team, but you also have to manage, um, yeah, like a, a management um, with very difficult questions in the hydrogen sector. And the last thing which was, I think, which made a difference in my interview is being positive. As you said, there will be, there are changes in the sector. There will be bits you will not win. There will be projects that you will not take FID. You need to be able to pick yourself up and move on to the next thing. So that positive approach, I think in my interview made a difference. Um, at least that was a feedback. I think that would be very, something we would be looking for. Yeah, I think a bit of resilience is, is required, mm -hmm. isn't it, for, for yeah. that? Um, and Mike, are you experiencing any sort of pinch points at the moment in terms of people asking you for, for roles or looking for candidates? Um, I think there's sort of maybe two answers to that. I mean, the, fir the first thing at the moment is that um, candidates are very, like, much more aware of the hydrogen industry than they were three or four years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and some of the industries you're taking from, you know, if you're looking at renewable energy, hydrogen you know, it's a question mark over some of the aspects and some of the applications that we're trying to do to create the economy in the sector that's needed. But so there's that side of it. Um, there's also the side of uh, clients. So, you know, Gotche mentioned about interview strategies and basically what you described there was what we call a talent unicorn. You know, an engineer that's commercially mindset, <laughs> with commercial mindset. I mean, like, let's be honest, if you go into engineering, you go into something with your hands and trying to fix a problem. You know, if you go into recruitment, you go into a sales environment, right? But you're you're trying to find someone that can, you know, engineer and electrolyze and, and come to a booth and talk about how it's applicable. So that like applications engineering side is, is a real difficult balance, um, which I suppose, you know, hopefully is the, the, proves the viability of a recruitment business, right? Because we're speaking to senior people, designing the job descriptions, talking about the types of talent that's available, helping and coach candidates through the interview process. So you're more likely to get like that joined up thinking, but I think the real pinch point is, is trying to find the balance between what is available to clients at the moment and, uh, you know, convincing candidates that hydrogen is, you know, here for the future and the long term. Um, I think in general, if you look at a talent pinch point that's coming, I mean, we're talking about hydrogen 2030. <laughs> we obviously work in the solar renewable sector. Project development post FID is probably one of the most difficult talent 
uh, short, well, probably one of the biggest talent shortages in Europe. Um, and then if you look at hydrogen operations and you look at LNG is probably your biggest transfer industry for that, mm. you know, half the LNG operations talent are, you know, coming to the end of their careers in 10, 20 years time, where's that talent? So embedding these operation skill sets and these pre-FID or post-FID developers now will help you train your graduates and your engineers to take on that skill sets rather than trying to find something that doesn't exist in 10, 15 years time. Yeah, very interesting. And it, obviously we're at the World Hydrogen Summit, are you seeing people moving a lot, you know, sort of to go and take roles in different countries because the opportunities lie there? Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, one thing we've been really lucky at, uh, as a business is being able to work across geographies, right? So I was talking to Fatima before we, before we came on, and what's been really interesting is, uh, although you can't mention too much, it's like I'm starting to have conversations with American companies about moving to Europe, which you kind of like, that doesn't really add up given all the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. but people are seeing opportunities in Europe now. Um, and... Yeah, I think that's probably probably one of the more exciting things. More say, I mean, we're I think we've got about eight open sales retainers at the moment for sales professionals, which, you know, that's a sure good sign that the industry's in the right space. People are looking to sell their tech, so yeah, things are moving positively, definitely. Yeah. Fatima, what sort of general advice would you give a young person looking to get into the hydrogen industry? Of course, um, first and foremost, I would uh, I would ask them to I, I would like to tell them that they they better have a good understanding of what is going on in energy transition and in the hydrogen space and the, the mega trends in general because hydrogen and energy transition is part of one mega trend that is happening right so they need to understand what is this direction of travel that the whole industry is moving toward and uh, they need to have that big picture in their mind when they are talking about hydrogen. And in addition to that one, I think it is very important beside the hydrogen sector itself, hydrogen is going to be produced to be used somewhere, right? I think a good understanding on the consumer side or the customers that eventually they will um, adapt to hydrogen, they have understanding on that side as well because then, then they can connect the dots between the supply side and the demand side, which is very important. And for the young people, I think the best thing is, you know, to be really exposed to the information, you know, go to conferences, exhibitions, and have a conversation with people that they have, you know, more experience than they, they, they have in this space, and be curious and ask questions, for example, and ask questions about the challenges that they are facing, about the projects that they are working, about the latest development within, their, within that, sec that part of the hydrogen sector that they are in and also follow the news and understand you know, what is the dynamic of the market. And I think this exposure will help them to generate some ideas, original ideas themselves, and then they can understand, okay, what part of this sector is really my part that I really want to contribute? And then they will go after the area that this is really you know, resonating well with their strengths and also their desire. And when you really like doing what you do, then you will, be, you will become successful in that case as well. Yeah, that resonates a lot. And Gotcha, from your side, what would the advice be to somebody? Yeah, I think it, it depends, again, a little bit like junior, mid-senior, senior. It, it changes a lot. Um, when I speak to, with women again hydrogen as well, I get reached out a lot. Um, what I'm seeing is often they know they want to work in hydrogen, but they don't know exactly what to do. Um, and, and that's okay, but I think it's good to have a preliminary plan. You do not need to have your five-year plan. You need to have a feeling of what will make you happy in the next few years. Um, and it's fine because you can change. I think it is absolutely, it was in the past that like you didn't want to change a lot of jobs. It didn't look good for your CV. You stayed in a job you didn't even like because yeah, it's not good for the CV. Honestly, go change and try. Um, try the startup world. It's exhausting, it's exciting, it's different. Try utility, work in the non-profit. I think it's really important to just not shy away from that. Even in, I think, senior roles, you can change. I know women and men, they changed every year in the last couple of years, and they still land on a nice senior role. And um, it's, it's harder, of course, and, and it's getting tighter these days, the market for senior roles. Um, but if you have a good reason to explain why, there's no problem, you need to be also fulfilled. So that's one thing I wanted to say. It is, of course, I'm not saying that it, 
the experience in one company, I don't devalue it. I think I have, my boss has been in Waterfall for 16 years. I am so lucky because he knows everything. Um, but I bring outside in experience, which is also valuable. So I think we should be open to try different things and be able to bring those outside in until maybe we stay a few more years or longer, 10 years in a company. So when you're young, just try it. Yeah, I think that's interesting. We've seen the evolution, as Mike was alluding to, you know, three versions ago of this event, four versions ago. I've seen people that have changed jobs three or four times now. They still keep coming to the event, which is brilliant for us. And the industry is very welcoming. I think that's what I'd say to the you know, sort of younger generation. Come to these events and, and people are prepared to spend time with you and invest in you, which I, I think is important. Uh, you mentioned the women in green hydrogen. Is that something, Mike, you're seeing more women applying for roles and getting into the industry? I think there's, um, as there should be, there's certainly a, a bigger focus on DNI. Me, me, I mean. um, you know, we've been factoring those types of searches, so like types of strategies into our searches for, you know, more so than we ever have done. You know, making sure that you've got a balanced shortlist versus, you know, experience, but you know, hitting your diversity metrics at the same time. And that does depend on where you are in the world and what you're allowed to do on that. But um, we've been very successful successful in that. I think if you're kind of like going back to kind of advising how someone can get into the sector, I think what's really important is, um, you know, if you are looking to break into the engineering world, perhaps, you know, if you're, you're female, the hydrogen industry is definitely more welcoming. There's less, you know, bureaucracy at the top. You know, you can actually move up these big companies very quickly. Um, I think if you're looking at just guiding generally on, on how you would enter the sector. I think self-marketing is, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, LinkedIn is a, is a beautiful tool. I mean, if you're on LinkedIn, you know, you're posting relevant news articles, you're um, sharing content, you're trying to connect with, you know, these two ladies and, and, and join in general debates and discussions on LinkedIn, and you go for an interview, the first thing someone does is look at your LinkedIn profile. You know, if you've got hydrogen all over it and you're, you're an engineer, you know, you, you're demonstrating that you're involved in the sector. Um, and I think the other thing is, is making sure you have, you know, when you get a job description online, you try and find three or four key achievements that you've done that are readily transferable and making sure you can describe them in a really succinct manner. And that will kind of help you demonstrate why your talent is applicable in a different, different space. Because it's all about solutions and how you can solve those problems, right? So, yeah. I think it's that versatility, isn't it? You, listening to you talk about that, we're all salespeople, ultimately. We're selling ourselves. Yeah, yeah, Even though you might be an engineer, we've got two doctors on stage. You know, we've got these academics. With having both of you on, in terms of that sort of academia, how important do you think it is for people to keep going and getting these qualifications to go to the next sort of level in terms of their education? I think, you know, having that foundation that you can really build on, it's very important. And uh, how solid your foundation is, it really depends on, you know, where you got your studies, right? So, you know, I do not underestimate, you know, the value of the, of, um, you know, of, you know, educations that you get, you know, official, you know, educations that you get. And, you know, the space that you are in and also the, sec uh, the, the universities that you are part of in order to build your foundation can play a key role in your understanding of that sector and also your approach on, you know, how you can solve the problems in that, uh, in that, uh, in that technical sphere, as you could be. And uh, in that sense, I think it's very important, but it's not everything. I think beside that one, you know, we all, you know, started when we did our undergrad, for instance. And within the job, then we learned that, okay, we need to add more capability into ourselves which is not necessarily coming from exactly the area that we did our studies, but maybe adjacent and maybe sometimes far from. And I think that, uh, you know, eagerness to do learning, you know, when it is really needed, will be part of the job going forward because we study for maybe for 10 years, 12 years, whatever, depending on the degree that you hold, but we will be working for 40, 50 years from now, right? And uh, you cannot just rely on that 10-year, you know, education that happened in, at the beginning of your career or at earlier stages. I think, you know, continuous learning and exposing yourself to new challenges would be very important. But the foundation is the basis that you can build everything on the top of that going forward. Yeah. Gotcha for you. Yeah. I mean, it's a really good point. And also, like, 
when you when I did my first first um, post grad when I did my masters I thought I'll graduate and everybody was waiting for me to be recruited of course it's not the case you think you know you have this fancy postgraduate from a good university but it's not like that so you have to really add more to that um, so I think that's that's one thing and what what was helpful for me to do the PhD um, and I've done it part-time while working was what was a network I think if you really um, have an opportunity to be in a place that is specialized in your field. You really get to network with people who will be in the future, perhaps, um, yeah, in your sector, you'll, you'll see them. Um, but honestly, what you learn from these experiences, and PhD is a straining experience, it is tough. You learn really soft skills. My PhD was on gas pipelines. I don't do anything with pipelines now, but I've learned soft skills. You learn to manage a large project. You learn patience. You learn to work on your own. We survived Corona thanks to PhDs, I think. Um, yeah, and also problem solving. I think it really helps you with that. Um, but again, work experience is equivalent. It can be equivalent as long as you are in an environment with continuous learning opportunities. So employers need to pay attention to that because also young people, when they don't learn, they leave. They will want to have access to knowledge. So to maintain talent as well, we have to have that component. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to open things up. We've got a few minutes left. If anyone in the audience has got any questions, there is a microphone, but you're so close, I hope we can hear you. Hang on, the microphone's coming. Just lady here. Hi, uh, my name is Julia Masalkina, and um, I would like to know your opinion about my situation. Um, I'm actively looking for a job in the hydrogen sector since January. I have a background in business administration. I'm graduating now uh, environmental economics, and my work experience is business development and business process optimization. And my experience, I mean, in job interviews, in the whole um, process of looking for a job, is that companies are looking for a candidate, what you said, that doesn't exist. And I, I see a lot that the uh, job is being reposted many, many times. And, um, I landed a lot of interviews, and um, I can't understand um, what I'm missing my profile to be here. I wrote my um, master thesis on hydrogen. I made a preliminary market research, and for the second time here. So my motivation is, I don't know, it's very high, high to work yeah. in this sector. And three years ago, I decided to, um, that I want to be a part of the uh, energy transition. And uh, that's why I went to do my uh, second master in environmental economics to bring these hard skills and my working experience to this sector. So can you comment on that? Can you give me a piece of advice? Probably Mike to yeah, start I, with. I can probably, yeah, I probably would go that. I think <laughs> the... Um, one of the issues you're, you're probably facing, which is what quite a lot of people are at the moment, is that um, LinkedIn is, if you're applying that way, is, is fairly smoke and mirrors when it comes to what job is actually live, you know, and whether it's a requirement for now or a requirement for the future. And it's kind of, it, it's a bit of a minefield to work out what, whether you're, whether you're applying for an actual job that exists, I suppose. Um, if you're in business development, uh, maybe maybe some of the advice that we give. When we send business development and sales candidates, for, okay, project. Okay, yeah. So you, you'll probably have a few key achievements that you, you know, you'd say your most notable things that you would discuss in an interview. You know, rather than sending a CV that's five pages long, you know, a few bullet points to your key achievements to hiring managers. Um, paying for a bit more of a premium LinkedIn subscription and trying to connect to the managers of the job and message them directly on LinkedIn. Um, a bit of guesswork, you can sometimes work out company emails as well, like trying to get an email directly into the inbox of the hiring manager uh, is probably a, a very advisable step. Um, I mean, I think the problem is you post a job on LinkedIn, if you're a company, you might get 5,000 applicants in three minutes if you don't set it up properly. So the pure administration task of going through that, especially 
you know, VAR Energy and Vattenpool, if you post a job, you, you know, the whole world applies. So how do you cut yourself above that is, is really important. And like, you know, I'm sure if someone emailed either of you directly with a few key achievements, you know, you'd at least get a, a five, 15 minute conversation. So maybe a more direct approach might, might uh, set you apart from competition. Does that answer your question? Thanks, Mike. And, and just to let anyone else know who does have questions, you can go and see Mike and his team uh, on stand C66. They'd be very happy to talk to people either obviously looking for talent or looking for roles and it sounds like you should perhaps carry that on. Uh, unfortunately, our time's come to an end on the stage. Been really interesting. I think could keep going for quite a while talking yeah, yeah. about this. It, it's a great topic. So just a huge thank you to, to Fatima, to Mike and to, and to Gotcha. And um, as I say, if you want any more information, please do sure. seek out Mike and his team at Boss Energy. I think any like talent advice, CV advice, just drop by and look at it, no problem. Thanks. Thank you.